My name is Rupert Lee Brown. Um, welcome to uh, to our Caxton webinar. Um, I'm Chief Executive at Caxton, uh, and as I trust you already know, Caxton is a leading player in the payments market, providing payment and foreign exchange services to private and corporate customers. Um, and as we have a growing number of family office and high net worth individuals that we do work for, uh, the subject of tax and in particular non-DOM tax status is of particular interest to us and to those clients, obviously. So we thought it would be a good idea to collect together a couple of experts and run through exactly what the rule changes are, uh, or the proposed rule changes, uh, and how they will affect you. Now, we want this to be an interactive session, so do please ask questions. Um, put them in the chat or comment box uh, that you should be able to see on the right of your screen, uh, and we will come to those towards the end of the session. Uh, so, to introduce our panellists this afternoon, um, first is uh, Mark Alul. Uh, he is a Gibraltar lawyer specialising in corporate, commercial, funds and tax and private client work. Uh, he's managing director of the law firm Alul & Co and also managing director of the associated regulated trust and company management firm Alul & Co Corporate Services. Overall, he has uh, over 25 years of experience as a lawyer and financial services practitioner and has played a significant part in the development of Gibraltar's legal frameworks. Uh, he served as of the Gibraltar Finance Centre Council and chairman of that council's company law reform committee that fed into the New Gibraltar Companies Act in 2014 and again in 2022. Uh, he's Gibraltar born and bred and joins us today from where I suspect it's markedly warmer than here in London. Uh, welcome, Mark. Okay, thank you very much, Rupert. I couldn't have introduced myself much better than, than, than you did. And it is nice, nice and sunny in Gibraltar, which is part of the appeal of coming here. So thank you for that. Good. OK. And um, our second panelist is Freddie Bjorn. Uh, Freddie is a partner in the private client department at Payne Hicks Beach, uh, which is a long established London firm of solicitors. Um, now, Freddie uh, advises on a broad range of UK and international clients on personal tax and trust issues, but he's very much a specialist in the area of non-domiciliary taxation, advising on estate planning, capital tax planning, and structuring of onshore and offshore trusts. Welcome, Freddie. Thank you very much, Rupert. Pleasure to be here. Good. Okay. So, um, if we get down to it, uh, on the 6th of March this year, the government, uh, Conservative government unveiled its plans for wide-ranging changes to the tax treatment of UK resident non-domiciled individuals, non-doms to you and me. Um, now, with an upcoming election, there's certainly likely to be changes to these plans, since the Labour Party has stated that it will go further than the Conservatives if it's elected and abolish the non-DOM regime altogether. But uh, that's slightly all up in the air, obviously. Um, let's deal with things that we do know, rather than speculating on any particular outcome of that. Uh, so, Freddie, um, give us the headlines. Uh, what are the major changes actually being mooted? So, the Conservative government rather took the wind out of Labour's sails in this regard, which is probably why Labour retaliated by saying they would go further. I will give you the, the rundown of what the Conservative government said and then just cover briefly what uh, the Labour government had suggested they'd extend. So the core message, as you've said, is this is the end of the non-DOM regime. So from the 6th of April 2025, the tax position will no, or for, for foreigners will no longer be based on their domicile status. It will be based on a residency test. And for these purposes, they have proposed that for the first four years of an individual being resident in the UK, they will be able to live here tax free in terms of their overseas uh, wealth. And unlike the current rules, that doesn't prevent them bringing that money in. Um, it is just a blanket four year tax free living. The important thing is that this is only available to those who've been non-resident for 10 years prior to that four year starting. So that, that's, that's the headlines. Um, there will be some concessions, or at least under the Conservative proposals, 
for those who are already here but won't benefit from that four year uh, period. So, for example, the first year, those who are able to claim the remittance basis will be able to do so at a 50% rate. And indeed, those who have offshore income and gains that they haven't brought into the UK yet, because they would be taxed if they do, would be able to bring them in at a very favourable rate of only 12%. Having said that, the Labour government have said that they wouldn't um, introduce the 50% um, rate for the first year. And indeed, there is a question mark over whether they think the 12% rate is too low. And indeed, whether the two years that that's available for under the Conservative proposals is too short. Those are the income and capital gains um, uh, tax headlines. The major headline, though, and the one that's probably driving most people's concern relates to inheritance tax. Um, as those who are attending might know, we have a very high rate of inheritance tax in the UK at 40%, which applies on death. Um, and there are some other ta uh, there are some other implications of transfers into trust. But with that headline rate of 40%, the proposal is to reduce the period of residence before you, you are in this net to um, just 10 years. And even worse than that, once you are once you've been caught by that 10 year rule, there will be a 10 year tail. So you could leave the UK and for the following 10 years still be within the UK inheritance tax net for your worldwide assets, even though you have no nexus whatsoever to the UK. So this is a major shake up. So, uh, in, in in practical terms, is that is that really viable? I mean, are we really going to be seeing HMRC chasing uh, um, uh, families or um, inheritors um, across the globe um, nine up to nine ten years after somebody's actually um, actually sh shuffled away? Well, that's got to be the the main question here, and the one that the politicians have got to consider because it's all very well introducing draconian rules, but if they can't be policed, then uh, they're probably creating a, a bigger problem than they're solving. And certainly within the industry, there is a pushback against the 10 year tail, which it does seem absolutely crazy. Um, the only people that seem to be benefiting from this are insurers who are potentially gonna have some windfalls for, for people trying to protect themselves when they leave. Um, so my suspicion is that 10 years will be watered down um, how they're going to do that, I'm not sure, uh, but that certainly does seem to be the one that's hardest to police and it is definitely the one that's driving any clients of mine who are leaving out of the UK because they just feel it's it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. Yeah, entirely understood. So um, if I can just reverse up slightly out of the weeds and, um, and talk more generally, um, so the difference between a current Dom. So let's say somebody who's been here for, for um, five years or so um, <clears throat> versus somebody who uh, who is considering moving here. What, 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 is, is, there a, is there a significant difference there for, for the, two, the two types of parties? Yes. So for someone who's considering moving here who hasn't been resident in the past 10 years, it's going to be a very attractive place for four years. And, and to my mind, it almost becomes a bit of a tax haven for four years while you, um, for example, if you've got a, a valuable business, um, you could leave your current jurisdiction, come to the UK, dispose of your valuable business while you're here, and then head back, having had four years of tax-free living. Um, I'm not sure that's what either government were looking to achieve, but it seems the most logical way of, uh, of using the system. For those who are already here, depending whether they've already seen out four years of residence here, um, the position probably looks bleakest for those who are between four years and 15 years. And I say that because those who've been here 15 years are effectively already treated as domicile for the vast majority of purposes. Those between four and 15 years probably thought that they had a good five to 10 years of very favorable tax free or tax living here. Uh, and suddenly everything's up in the air. They've got no certainty and they've potentially got very draconian tax rules coming in. Yes, absolutely. So that, that, that four year window, as you say, is, is an opportunity, but uh, with, a, with, a, with a change of government, again, that might, that might change uh, again in, um, well, 
certainly not in the next few months, but certainly a little bit later on. Um, yeah. And leading to yet more uncertainty, which is all fabulous, fabulous for, for everybody, not. Um, so um, in, in, terms of, in terms of options, uh, in terms of strategies, in terms of what, uh, what uh, non dogs can do, um, are, there, are there alternatives uh, to staying in the UK? There certainly are. Um, since 2013, the UK has had what we call a statutory residence test, which means a test which, which basically can be applied to each individual to ascertain whether they are UK resident or non-UK resident in a particular tax year. And it is therefore, and we are doing a lot of it, quite viable to plan for non-resident status from the end of the current tax year, which runs from five eight, uh, sorry, from six April in this year to five April in 2025. So we are seeing a number of people starting to put plans in place to leave the UK to more benign tax jurisdictions. Um, and I suspect this brings in neatly um, someone over in Gibraltar. Yes, Gibraltar. Well. Gibraltar is, um, is a British territory in the south of Spain, and we are a low tax jurisdiction. We're a, a finance centre. We have regulated trust and company managers, um, and lawyers, accountants, um, and banks. But we're in the south of Spain, so we're a little bit of Britain in the, in, in the sunshine. So it's a place British people feel very comfortable when, when they come here. And for those non-DOMs in the UK who are able to and willing to, to leave the UK, uh, Gibraltar is an, an ideal home. Um, we have several um, tax advantages. There's a, a program for high net worth individuals where they pay a relatively low amount of fixed tax per annum on the worldwide income. Um, it's around 40,000 pounds per annum. And they're allowed to include their spouse in that tax um, certificate. So they could come here and um, then become resident in, in Gibraltar, no longer in the UK, and they could, would be outside the um, UK rules. They would have to leave the UK um, properly, and that's where um, Freddie would be able to uh, advise them. Um, but it's not only um, the tax breaks here. It's um, Gibraltar is connected to Europe. We're at the south of Spain. We have a land frontier with Spain. So Gibraltar is a small place, but it's very safe. Um, uh, English education system, all our students go to UK universities, but it's also very easy to drive across the border and visit lovely places in the south of Spain. And there's Marbella, there's the Granada, the Sierra Nevada ski resort is three hours drive away. There's beautiful white sandy beaches and the southwest coast um, in, the, the, um, in the Tarifa area. Um, so it is an alternative to being in some other uh, islands, you know, remote islands, which uh, may not offer such, such a good quality of life. Sorry, trying to get myself off mute. There we go. Um, uh, constant problem for the last four years, hasn't it? Uh, so, so Mark, that, um, that that's um, it. It sounds it sounds like Gibraltar is is a um, from a, from a tax perspective uh, could be a lot more attractive than. I mean, it, my my understanding is, for example, that in Italy, um, it's a, I think it's a it's, it's a hundred thousand. Perhaps Freddie can confirm that. I think it's about a hundred thousand base uh, base. Yeah. yeah. So at forty thousand, okay. that sounds uh, that sounds considerably better value. But um, uh, so just to clear up all the sort of um, the issues around around um, Gibraltar's relationship with the UK and with the EU um, yeah. after Brexit, um, the the UK is, is uh, having a little bit of difficulty in terms of um, in terms of doing business with our with our immediate neighbours. Um, is am I right in understanding that there's a there's an upcoming uh, Brexit treaty specifically for Gibraltar? Uh, that, that's right. I mean, in constitution, I mean, we were in the EU together with the UK and we actually voted 96% to remain in Gibraltar for obvious reasons because we um, have a free flowing frontier between Gibraltar and Spain most, most of the time. And we have um, more than 15,000 people coming into work every single day, even though we're only 38,000 people um, in Gibraltar. So our Brexit treaty is being done at the moment where 99% there, and it's being negotiated by the British government on our behalf 
directly with the EU, uh, because constitutionally Britain is responsible for our foreign affairs and, and our defence, incidentally, as well. And obviously our um, chief minister um, is there at the negotiations, and so is the Spanish foreign minister. So we're, we're actually very, very excited about this. We're, we're nearly there. Um, the negotiations will take a few more weeks and months, and the main aim will be to remove the land frontier and give us free access to the, to the Schengen zone. So that will make it even more attractive to live in Gibraltar. And we don't have a detail yet, but it's expected that anybody who is resident in Gibraltar, has a Gibraltar residence card, will be able to have free access to the, to the whole Schengen zone. So we wait to see the, the detail. So it will make us a really very, very attractive place um, um, to live. So um, I can't wait. Let's see if it all comes no, together. But, Sure. And, and, for, uh, and again, for clarity, in terms of uh, residency, uh, this, is, th this is tax domiciliation rather than, rather than residency, uh, or, or the two kind of tied, um, tied together? Well, there's, you can have a tax status for high net worth individuals, but residence is a matter of, of fact. If you live here for more than half, half a year, you would be in law, you would be residents. But upon being granted um, tax status, you are entitled to apply for a Gibraltar residence card. And it's quite simple for persons from the UK and from the EU and the EEA, because they are already entitled to live and work in Gibraltar without a work permit or, or a visa. We control our own immigration policy. So we, we have set our, on our, own, our own rules. So residence in Gibraltar, um, we, we expect, will allow persons to flow, flow freely throughout the Schengen zone without, without restriction. Uh, it's worth just saying on the residence point, because um, some, sometimes people ask, well, can you be resident in two places or can you be resident in no places? And the answer to both from a UK perspective is yes. I mean, you can be dual resident, but you could equally be non-resident anywhere. And the interesting thing about these proposed new rules is with the end of the domicile status for tax purposes, it, it does clear up one issue which is often a problem, uh, certainly for people who have a, a long-standing UK nexus. Because, for example, prior to any new rules, someone who was born in the UK or had UK domicile parents may not know what their domicile is for whatever reason i mean domicile is a complicated area um uh, it's based on the domicile of your father at the date you're born but there are other factors at play these new rules will mean that no longer does uh, do the the people in that situation have to worry about the uh, the domicile rules they can simply work on the residence rules of each jurisdiction which means that if you're leaving the uk we now effectively have a day counting test, as I say. Um, the day counting test is, it, it has a range in it. But let us say we, we advise a client, you can spend 90 days in the UK uh, and still remain non-resident, but no more. It makes it easier for someone in Mark's position to say, great, we know that from a UK perspective, you're not resident in the UK. And therefore, you're under our, you know, under our jurisdiction for everything. Whereas at the moment, we would have a bit more of a problem because of the domicile um, link. Yeah. yeah, I mean, when you move to Gibraltar, um, you are you do receive your, your residence card, you get a, a, ta a tax number. These are things which, when you go to a bank, for example, um, is one of the standard questions, what is your tax or reference number? What's your residential address? Do you have proof of, of residence? So people moving to Gibraltar would have all of these tools um, available available to them and it's from experience it has been an issue with some clients in, in the past cool um so the um the, the burning question i think for for, for for some of our clients would be who, who are blended in terms of uh in terms of incorporation and and high net worths um so with with for example with family offices um how do how do these changes affect family offices specifically, Freddie? If you if, if you can answer that, and then and then Mark, I'm, I'm sure you you probably got a view on that too. Yeah. So uh, we are seeing family offices um, both come and go from the UK. 
it is probably worth saying you know, what is a family office for these purposes and um, often family offices cover a broad range and and cover anything from um, an individual who effectively oversees the family's affairs in a single jurisdiction to a far more complicated investment structure um, for a very wealthy international family now I suspect the latter is what we're talking about here. But if you were to have a single family office, uh, there's a corporate question about where that office is based. And obviously, the, the corporate question um, invariably, even if there are elements of it in the UK, we are not a particularly friendly tax jurisdiction for corporates. So often the family office itself, the, the investment arm will be based overseas. But I think the bigger question for a family office is is looking at the wider family how will these rules impact the various individuals within that family and what will that mean in terms of dynastic wealth and I, I i hate to keep going back to the same thing namely inheritance tax but it is such a major um uh, form of uh, well, it, 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 it's such a destroyer of wealth that it can't be ignored and certainly with our family office clients at the moment many of them are not in the UK and they're looking to us because members of the family are over here and they're saying, you know, what's going to happen? I mean, we haven't touched on trusts yet and I'm sure we'll come on to them, but they're beneficiaries of a trust. Does that open up the entire trust? They're living over there. Their, their father or mother wants to give them a significant gift. What would be the implications of that? So for a family office, I think these have major ramifications um, and the uncertainty really not helping there. But I would say that if um, it, this is the year to consider whether a family office should be based outside the UK. Um, and, I, and I know from speaking to Mark that Gibraltar certainly has the op options in that regard. Yes, yeah, a word on inheritance tax first. Gibraltar is a, is a well-regulated, highly regarded um, ju ju jurisdiction. Um, we, we don't have inheritance tax. So anybody moving here, um, their estate would not be subject to inheritance tax. Now, I mentioned being a well-regulated jurisdiction because we're actually, our regulatory regime is actually aligned with that of the UK. And it's because we are allowed to passport financial services into, into the UK and vice versa. And we're the only place after Brexit which is allowed to do this. And for example, um, motor insurance in Gibraltar is, is, is very, very big. And about 25% of all UK motor insurance policies are actually underwritten by, by Gibraltar companies. So I say this, that if anybody's going to move here, they're moving to a well-regulated, well-regarded um, jurisdiction where things are done, are done properly and to, the, and to the highest standards. As regards investment income, um, we have no tax on investment income in Gibraltar, but it's not done on a, on a, um, on a discriminatory basis that for, for nobody. So a private individual who has a bank account and earns some interest or has a portfolio won't pay tax on investment income. Income. Likewise, with a, a a professional investment fund or a family office, so all of the money invested would not pay tax on investment income, and there's no capital gains tax too. So it actually makes us an ideal location to set up a family office, and an, and an increasing number of them are actually moving to um, Gibraltar. Our law is based on English law, so it is possible to have a Gibraltar board of directors managing and controlling the the fund or the family office from from gibraltar which would make sure it's kept within the gibraltar tax network and if there are any uk resident individuals connected or uk domiciled individuals connected um, careful tax advice from someone like freddie obviously is, is necessary to make sure that the we do keep within we keep the family office within the gibraltar tax network and hence not pay tax on the investment income Thank you, thank you. Uh, I mean, it, it, just just in terms of kind of some some uh, some really uh, simple case studies, um, Freddie, is, is there just some? Um, I mean, it, let's say for example, you've you've got a, a married couple who are both of whom are, are, are non domiciled but they have uh, they have a child uh, at, um, at at school here in the UK. Um, what what happens under those circumstances? Yeah. So. The first thing you want to see is how long they've been resident here. Let us assume that they've been here more than 10 years, so they get caught 
have lots of and barrels by everything that's planned. Um, certainly where there's dynastic wealth, it, it pains me to do it, but I don't see an option for them other than to cease UK residents if they want to avoid that IHT risk. Um, most clients of mine, however wealthy, are relatively relaxed about the idea of being taxed on an arising basis on income and capital gains tax. You know, they accept the fact the children are at school here. Let's say they've got five to 10 years left at school. OK, it's going to be high tax jurisdiction for that period. But, you know, we just have to accept that. The, the much, you know, the much greater concern is those who've got dynastic wealth, which is scattered around the world. Uh, and let's call it 100 million to be, you know, for argument's sake, they are literally sitting with a 40 million pound exposure, which it's all very well to say, well, you know, well, that's just the children will suffer. But actually, a lot of these families, they view wealth as a, a much greater thing than just down one branch of the family. Um, so I think in that instance, where you've got someone who's who's got kids here at school, they have they have to think about leaving and they have to think about whether or not they leave their kids at boarding school here or they take their kids you know, to school outside. There are uh, there is a specific exception. I say exception. There's a specific provision in the residency rules, which effectively says that when you're doing your day counting tests, you can ignore children who are resident here if they're only here at school and only spend well, they spend less than 21 days in the UK outside of holiday time. So basically, it is designed to stop dragging people into the UK residency net who are using the UK boarding system. Now, there will be people who that's very attractive to and they say, well, that's exactly the direction we want to go. There will obviously be others who say, look, quite honestly, I'm not interested in having kids at boarding school. And, and as I say, I don't really see any, uh, an option for those people, uh, especially where I'm sorry, I, I'll finish on a minute, but especially where the kids are young, as invariably they will be at school, because there's no option then to make material shifts onto the next generation um, without exposing that for that young generation. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. And um, an option would be, again, I, I'm plugging Gibraltar a lot, to, place, to move to a place like Gibraltar. Um, we do have an English education system. We're only two and a half hours flight flight away. And um, uh, as Freddie mentioned, the kids either can use a Gibraltar schools or they could still remain at boarding school in, in, in the UK, whereas the controls of, of, of the wealth of persons entitled to the wealth could be in, in Gibraltar and therefore outside the UK tax system. Excellent, excellent. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, uh, we haven't even scratched the surface, I, I, I get the impression. Um, we do have a question uh, from Graham, um, one of our viewers, that, um, uh, and this is for you, Mark. Uh, how does Gibraltar define high net worth individual numerically uh, and otherwise? Yes, well, under our, our programme, we call it Category 2 status. Um, you need to have 2 million pounds worth of, of, of net assets and um, and you need to that's that's how we define wealth but the other requirement is you have to provide um, your due diligence show how you've earned your wealth and the government does a deep due diligence drive dive to make sure that we are only bring reputable reputable persons here and the other requirement is to rent or buy a property of, of a certain level after you you have been approved and normally it takes about one to two months to be to be approved or, or not. Yeah, and ju just for clarity, is that two million in liquid assets, or can property? Can your main residence be included in that as a figure? Yes, property can be included. Um, 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 if there's a mortgage, that would have to be taken into into account. So normally, what clients do, they go to their accountants and they give them a evaluation letter, say, look. I've known uh, Mr. or Mrs. X for, for so long, and of my own knowledge, I know they have net assets worth X, and that's and that's accepted. Good. Um, that's uh, that's a very uh, very interesting very interesting um, area. So uh, I think that uh, we're we're now thirty minutes into this. And, um, uh, as I said, we've barely even scratched the surface. Uh, if 
there are any further any further questions that you as individuals might have, then obviously you can reach out to uh, either Mark or Freddie individually. Um, I understand that their contact details are, have been somewhere posted somewhere uh, as part of this. If they haven't, then uh, reach out to your contact at Caxton, and we can we can certainly um, certainly introduce you. Um, but I, I hope that this has been uh, been of use to you all. Um, it's certainly been very interesting, and, and it's been delightful uh, to work with both Freddie and Mark on this. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly jealous of the of the of your background, Mark. Um, I think it's um, yeah, it's, I, I've I've got uh, I've got clouds where I am, but I don't think you have. No, okay, it's a, it's a virtual background, full full confession, but it is sunny outside. Surely not. Surely not. Right. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure, and we look forward to seeing you on the next on the next webinar that we do. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.